Yes, but not on country. <clears throat> But it's not on the whole screen. Okay. Yes, is it now available in full screen? Not yet. Not yet to me. Any other no, answer? It's not yet. Not. <clears throat> I think you should enable editing, then I think the full screen option will okay. be available. Okay. Yes. Yes, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So welcome and good evening to one and all. Today we have assembled virtually to attend uh, August, a monthly uh, event of our Friends of Elephants. And uh, it could not get any wonderful than this uh, auspicious day when we are celebrating Ganesh Chaturthi, where devotees worship uh, elephant-headed Hindu god Ganesha. So let us now begin the uh, event and I'll start first with the introduction of what is Strengths of Elephants. So. So those who are joining us for the first time, it will serve as an introduction of Friends of Elephants and those who have been with us for a longer time, it will just serve as a reminder. So Friends of Elephants is not an organization and is not proposing to become one. It is an informal group of people coming together with varied expertise concerned about elephants and other wildlife. The group is a forum for disseminating knowledge linked to elephants and other wildlife science, conservation, welfare through art, culture, literature, movies, talks, and panel discussions. Our expectation is that people who have attended our events gain knowledge in a very informal way and also on their own and are with their pro proximity to the people from policy making, help in developing appropriate conservation and welfare measures for wildlife, including elephants. So the uh, schedule of today's event is as follow. Uh, the introduction will be given by me, that is Ashna Sinha. The first talk will be delivered uh, by Dr. B. Navinthan, and the topic of the talk is The Ancient Giants and Modern Problems. The second talk will be delivered by Mr. Pradeep M.A. Uh, his topic is A. Cap Caprine in the Western Ghats, the Nilgiri Thar. Then it will be followed by a conversation in between Mr. Pradeep and Dr. B. Navinthan. The topic of the conversation will be elephants and Nilgiri tar, are they two distinctly different species but have a common conservation concern? And then it, we will have a QA and a session with Dr. B. Navintan and Mr. Pradeep moderated by Matthew George. So I'd now request all the participants except our speakers to mute themselves so that we can facilitate this event smoothly and uh, uh, I would like to tell uh, all, all, all of our participants that all the questions uh, will be taken in the end of the event. So please write them down in your com comment uh, chat box 
and it will be taken up by our speakers. So here is a bit of introduction about me. So I'm Ashna Sinha, a native of Patna, Bihar. I have pursued MSc in Ecology and Environment Studies from Nalanda University. I worked in as, as an intern for Elephant Research Conservation Program at ANCF. And during my internship, I in, got, was introduced to the research area involving captive elephants and their usages in cultural and religious processions. This topic interested me the most, which further motivated me to know more about it. And so during COVID pandemic, I enrolled myself in MA Anthropology from IGNU with a genuine eagerness and will to understand the role of humans in shaping their environment and its influence on non-human. My research interests include human animal studies, spiritual ecology, deep ecology, captive elephant welfare, and conservation. So the first talk will be delivered on the topic, the ancient giants and modern problems. It will be delivered by Dr. B. Navinathan. Let us know more something, uh, some information about Dr. B. Navinathan. Dr. Navinitan Bala Subramanyam Subramani has completed his PhD work on the ecology of reintroduction of boar in Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve, Central Indian landscape. After completion of his MSc, he joined as a field biologist with WWF India in Western Ghats landscape. From 2010 to 2017, he was with Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, monitoring tigers, scope predators, prey, and their natural habitat program. Monitored, reintroduced gore in Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve, Madhya Pradesh. In 2017, he joined RNF as a research associate and project coordinator in Assam, India, to coordinate tiger research work in the Northeast India. In 2018-19, he worked with Vanashri Nature Conservation Foundation Coimbatore as a research coordinator. In 2019, he joined GIZ, a technical expert in Indo-German project on human wildlife conflict mitigation in India as a state coordinator for Karnataka. Currently, he is with WWF India in the Western Ghats Nilgiri landscape as a specialist in elephant conservation program. His key specializations and interests are conservation biology, population ecology, habitat ecology, and human animal conflict. So the second talk will be delivered by Mr. Pradeep M.A. Uh, the topic of his talk is a Caprine in the Western Ghats, the Nilgiri Tar. Let us know a little bit about Mr. Pradeep. Mr. Pradeep M.A. has graduation in botany and a post-graduation in wildlife biology from Government's Art, Arts College, UTI. He worked with WWF from 2007 to 2013 under various conservation programs in the Western Ghats landscape primarily involved in the Nilgiri Tar Conservation Program and surveyed Nilgiri Tar population in most of the hills from Nilgiris to Kanyakumari in the Western Ghats. He has associated with the Wildlife Institute of India from 2013 to 2018, worked as a senior project fellow to look at the population genetics of the Nilgiri Tar across its range currently since 2019. He is associated with WWF India in the Western Ghat Nilgiri landscape to coordinate the Nilgiri Tar conservation program across its range. We will then have a, a conversation in between Mr. Pradeep and Dr. Navinathan. The topic of that conversation is elephants and Nilgiri Tar, are they two distinctly different species but have a common conservation concern? This session, the Q&A session will be moderated by Matthew George. Participants are requested to write their questions and queries in the chat box. The questions and uh, questions will be taken up by our speakers in the end of the session. So here's a bit of, of information about Matthew. Matthew George Sankar Mangalam is a businessman who is passionate about elephants. He has been part of Friends of Elephants since its inception and has supported our activities. Matthew has served as a well volunteer of the forest department and an NGO on varying activities connected with elephant conservation over the last 15 years, taking time out from his work. He disseminates knowledge he gained on elephants over the years through his blog, 
and encourages the public to support conservation activities. I'll now request uh, Dr. B. Navinthan to uh, take the mic forward and just start the event. I'm muting myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the brief introduction and thanks for this opportunity. And good evening all uh, for this great evening. So I'll share my screen. Can you let me yeah. know if it is visible? Uh, is it visible? Yes, yes. Yes, it is visible. Yeah. So I'll start. Is my voice okay? Or it's yes. like yes, it's yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, so today's talk about the influence of elephants day, which has been organized by NCF and uh, thing like uh, the talk will be on the Asian giant and the modern problem. So before getting into what the Asian giant and how, because th th this program has been going for a very long period. And just we want to just come out, come in between for a talk. So there will be like general, general kind of ecology stuff. People will be knowing more of the details. So I'll be having a re-emphasis of this uh, general ecology, and we'll be touching upon what is the modern current problem and how do we uh, come to a solution to mitigate this problem. So that's how the overall of the talk, the, the overall view of the talk. So be, just before getting into what do elephants and getting into that, how do the species and how the landscape looks in the globe. When we talk about the Yellowstone National Park in the western part of the globe, the human population is low, like, and the animal population is more. There is like vast uh, habitat uh, patches available without any uh, disturbance. But the similar kind of scenario when we come to Africa and savanna forest, there are excessive land availability. Like there are multiple species and multiple species congregation is there, and the land availability is much more vast compared to other. Uh, other parts of the country. Even uh, if, the, if the reserve should be managed in a proper way, they have a highly managed reserve, like fence, fence reserve or the game reserves or the national parks, which has been highly managed <clears throat> in Africa. But in Indian scenario, it's like people, we have a different kind of, of uh, reserves, reserve management. So why do these play a critical role when we talk about like, okay, we're talking about elephants, how do this come into crucial role? Like I'm talking about the overall perception about conservation. What is the complex conservation scenario that country faces today? Like it's a different uh, scenario what we talk about when we talk about Africa and uh, the Western part of the globe, where our scenario is totally different. We have to have an uh, equal coexistence kind of way, like a mutual coexistence, that's all. This is not only for tiger, we have for different species, for god example, which is like highly uh, now adaptive to the cities, like, and it is also sites for the elephants. It's not so this kind of images, but today's scenario, we have to have a discussion on this, like how do we manage these kind of situations? So this, this is all the conclusion scenarios, what is, what is happening in the recent past for the species. When we talk about the species, when we talk about the globe, there's more human population in the white cycle, rather than the entire group. So this is this is an indicator that there is more human population comparing to other uh, group. So what do, what do that leads into? Like when we talk about this forest cover where the animals live, uh, uh, preferably in the forest and the forest now which has less connectivity, India has only 21% of uh, forest cover comparing to the entire uh, thing. Like it's like not even 25%. So that's, that's one of the things like we have to work on the habitat cover or the forest cover. And we talk about the landscape wise for the central Indian landscape, the western parts, the eastern parts, the Himalayas, the northeast, the northern east part, or the western part of the country. There is no connectivity. There is no major connectivity is happening in the forest, in between the forest patches. So itself, it's an indication that we have to morally work on the uh, forest cover to protect the animals rather than rather than thinking about population increase other stuff. We have to also talk about the uh, habitat cover. <laughs> So this just want to give an overview of what is what is happening in the uh, forest and how the conservation scenario is happening today. So just uh, making this brief and coming into today's talk is like the gentle giants, like uh, such a beautiful animal and has this uh, uh, beautiful creature to support other animals. Not only they live for them, they also live for other uh, herbivores which, which uh, belong to their uh, thing. When we talk about elephants, how do it comes to a culture? Like this is religious part, right? Like we, uh, from a younger age, from, for, from age of eight months to one year, we'll be talking about more of uh, thing of elephants and things like with the toys and things than the 
Ganesh Chaturthi, then the Ganesh, all these things, it comes under our culture. So based on that only, we still think about how do elephants come into our culture. So then this culture evolves when we go to temples, then there are, there are sculptures, there are stone carvings, the Asian things which are being used in this. So this all comes in a very long history. It's not only suddenly we jump into elephants and things. It's an inborn thing for us. It's a religious part for our thing. Then we have a cultural aspect where the elephants have been uh, used in elephant, uh, used in the temples to worship or to use the other activities uh, in the uh, uh, temples and other parts. Like the example we have, Tirishur, like such a beautiful festival, for, especially for elephants. So all these things, it's 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 kind of an religious which has been there. So other than then, it's all it's a common thing. What about the general ecology of elephants? It's uh, it's a symbol of our culture rather than a species. It's a symbol of our culture, and we should be more privileged. That's a keystone species in the Asian tropical forest. Like that is the that is the main thing that what uh, what is the uh, important thing of that. And uh, India is the largest population of the entire uh, Asian elephants. There are two species that we know, like Asian elephants and African elephants. But when we talk about Asian elephants, we have the largest number of of elephant population uh, in the entire distribution in the southern part in the uh, Southeast uh, Asia. So India, the estimated population in uh, in, the, in India is something around 27, in, in between 27,000 to 29,000. The population, the recent elephant population, uh, census population done in 2018. So based on that, this is the number that we have. And this is a schedule on species and we are much more privileged as a national heritage. And, and today's concept is most of the elephant, we often come into conflict in a country because both have, we have to have a share the uh, spatial requirements. So which, which, which animals also need and which we also need. We'll be touching upon that in the further slides. So when we talk about the Asian elephant distribution, the distribution across 13 different countries uh, in this uh, Southeast Asia, like India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, like all these things. And when we talk about all these uh, areas, this population is very less. But when we're in India, we have more than uh, near about 30,000 individual of population. So that's the privilege that we have more number of population. But where do this population represent? Like, it's like we, can, we can have a, there is a, a you know, not continuous thing. We have a certain population in the southern part of the country. It's so called the Western Ghats landscape, then the Central Indian landscape, then the Northeast landscape, then the Northern part, like, like Himalayas, the Shivalik uh, region. Like these are the landscape that has been distributed. And recently, they got uh, the Central Indian landscape where the multi British also has been included, where the uh, elephants have been there for like, two to three years. It has been observed in the Tiger River, like Sanjay Tiger River, Bandar Tiger. Then, what do like, where do these elephant distribution in India? Mainly, when you talk about there is an elephant project, elephant, there is a special uh, like NTCA, like for National Tiger Conservation, we have a special uh, thing in India. We call this project elephant. Uh, in India, there are 32 elephant reserves, but suppose 10 elephant landscapes in 16 states, like 17 states where multi British also now currently being included. Because two, two to three years now, the elephants are being continuously roaming in the eastern part of Madhya Pradesh uh, landscape. Uh, I'll just go on the map. This is the eastern part of Madhya Pradesh landscape where Sanchi Tiger, Bandhapu Tiger, and Kana also now recently been reported with a uh, few elephants. Over. So one of the main role of elephants when we talk about is the main uh, the seed dispersal, uh, the, the largest seed dispersal. Birds are the main thing of the seed dispersal, where elephants has a key uh, role in this, uh, dispersal of seeds of the larger seeds with the, uh, when it intakes the foods and the larger number of seeds is being dispersed. Elephants are browse and grazers when they, uh, when they do browse and uh, when the tall trees have been rigged up and which are making branches uh, and may way ways to other herbivores to survive in that landscape. So it's a beautiful phenomenon how this individual help in other uh, other animals that move around in the in, in their uh, areas. And it's an endangered species. We all know about like uh, it's, uh, it's like not in critical endangered, but still in endangered. But uh, we should work on more on population and the habitat. To make this in a vulnerable position because and easily when we talk about 20,000 or 25,000 of elephants in, in India, now we are all in a pandemic situation where we can see a small disease can easily wipe out uh, kind of a population. So this should not be happen. So we have to also think about in the future thing also on the uh, one health component that we have to think about it. That's, these are the general things that the high length and weight like uh, it's like it's uh, the taller herbivore uh, in the living species and this length is 21 feet and weight up to five tons adult bull 
and they mostly prefers a tropical forest part and in the southern part we have moist deciduous forest and, and red deciduous forest and they prefer grassland in large number. When we talk about the overall population, the numbers are like something around 27,312 uh, individuals in 2018 since I've already mentioned it. But when we talk about which state has more number of population, Karnataka has more number of elephant, elephant uh, individuals, 6,000 plus 6,000, and Assam followed by Assam is 5,000, and Kerala. Tamil Nadu stands in for something around 2,500 individuals, 2,754 individuals are there. So only like this is a general thing that I have kept it in the slide, but uh, we know that only males have tusk in Asian elephants and female. Uh, there are males uh, which is uh, there are males without tusk is called as magna. The meaning of magna is like when you think of a gift. Like I imagine a male is without a tusk, so that's why it's called as magna. Magna is the name of gift, so it's a gifted elephant, so that's why we call it as magna for that. And African elephants are both both, both males and females have the tusks. So when we talk about the social organization, the uh, female lives in herds and uh, males also associate at a certain period of time and they leave the herds. And the suburban wolves are associated with the herds only. And they are mostly matriarch, uh, matriarchal society where the older female leaves the herd. And males, like sometimes they, they be in the thing and they mostly, uh, after the rut season, like after the uh, must season, we say for elephants is must. It's like mostly move in the bachelor group. Which has been easily observed in most of the parts where these mostly these bachelor herds come into conflict or the single lone tusk that come into conflict with elephants. So then when we talk about the role of elephants in the ecology, well, how, what is the main thing as discussed over the seed dispersal when we uh, took an elephant dung and started analyzing like what are the good habits, like things that have been done. There are like several number of uh, seeds that has been uh, Tube and it has been undigested, certain things will be digested and something will not digested. All the undigested food will be used as uh, uh, seeds that has been dispersed from one place to another place. So this is a phenomenon of, uh, of the seed dispersal through uh, elephants. This is a uh, thing like where, where you can see bamboos and other trees, like the larger trees, where uh, the uh, dunks will be used, used as fertilizers. And this will be started growing. Not all the seeds will be growing, but most 50, 60 percent of the seeds which has been dispersed started growing, and it has its own survival because of other herbivores are there. It might leave or it may not leave to grow to the taller trees. But when we think about uh, elephant dung and other stuff, like how do we think about an ecosystem? It's a healthier ecosystem and stuff. When we see other butterflies, which which been uh, utilizing this dung part, like it's also been a beautiful phenomenon. How these elephants? It's also helping other small insects and species which have been eaten. For example, dung beetle. Where does dung beetle carry few seeds with them to under the uh, soil? Like over the soil, it will be washed away, and certain soil, uh, certain seeds will be taken inside the under the soil, and it will be it will be for germination. So this is a beautiful phenomenon of the entire uh, thing. Right? It's a beautiful phenomenon when when the elephant is being. Can I continue? Oh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Then elephants also helps the other individuals, right? Like when uh, when there's uh, uh, less uh, water in the streams, I think the elephant move in that particular part and make the damp area, like make uh, make make holes in this particular area. When the elephant moves, there's a body weight that makes automatically kind of a small hole kind of stuff. Sub waters, uh, sub waters for elephants. Where with this help, like other healthy wolves, which is trying to go out of the forest and try getting into conflict or getting being poached or getting being killed. So these animals are strained back inside to, to use this water. So this is a beautiful phenomenon how this has been associated with us. And everybody might like we might have known about this, like the importance of salt, like uh, when it in more summers, these animals might be having mostly uh, only have uh, grace foods, right? Like uh, high uh, foods in fiber content. So when the fiber should be digested in a proper way, the animals might take in a lot of foods, but all are fiber content. So when the fiber should be digested in a proper way, it need more salts, right? But the water might not be sufficient. So then the animals try to use the salt lake areas. So salt lake areas are in the uh, ground also, but in some in few landscape, they are in a little bit of higher elevation where other animals may not be reached there. So this elephant try to move there and pick the soils over there, then the soil erosion takes place. This is a beautiful phenomenon of ecology, how these animals help so other individuals and also used to use the entire uh, ecosystem in a proper way. So this is how it is like a uh, general thing. But when we think about the modern problem, like before we talk into the problem, we have to talk about the species. How how do we age or age these species, right? Until unless if we are not identifying like what is the herd size, what is the uh, what is the animal 
what is the age scenario of this individual? But we can't have a mitigation measure for like a three year elephant and a 30 year elephant. It's totally a different thing, like when we want to create a mitigation problem. That's how, like, that's before that, for that, we need a proper, clear aging of elephants, a group such in, in an area. When we talk about area, then that area will be a landscape, then the landscape will be like multiple landscapes. So one mitigation measure cannot be implemented in the other landscape because might be the habitat might be thing, but the mitigation measures can be modified in such a way and can be implemented in different landscape to see how the species is being adapting to that particular. So for that, the aging is more important uh, when we when we when, when we want to talk about it. When we take a beautiful photograph, but Today, we, it can be a meaningful photograph to identify these individuals rather than uh, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we talk about a conflict scenario today, like each and, if in each and every landscape, when we see this elephant ranging landscape, then mostly the uh, bulls will be coming out or like coming out and creating conflict uh, in, in some villages or in some croplands or in the plantation areas. So when we talk about all these things, whether do we have a capacity to identify whether this is the individual that has been creating the conflict rather than I think saying that elephant is creating a problem, like how many individuals are creating problem? Where are they coming? And how do we, as for tigers and leopards, we have uh, patterns and we use, but for elephants also based on the natural uh, identification features, it can be easily identified. There are different type of uh, with the help of photography, it can be easily identified. We, at least we can try to identify 90% of the population rather than not 100% can be identified in the way because they're all in a different scenario. But 90% of the population can be identified based on the photograph. But each and every photo can be used as a meaningful photograph and can be a logical photograph. When, see, when, when I show the multiple photograph, there are, there are different bags like striped bag. There's a lower broken uh, breaker. Then there is a sloppy bag. Then there's a square bag. All these things as different thing. Not only about the body shape, about the tail, tail shape, tail length, all these things plays a crucial role when we talk about identification of certain individuals. So when we talk about identification, we also should see like what are the other natural things can be used with the help of photographs, like the body size, the tail length, the tail, cut tail length, uh, then the uh, task, task, uh, uh, according to their panel, the stripe panel, the curve, the opposite, V nation, the thickness, the broadness of the, the base broadness, the base thickness, uh, all these things should be considered and the parallel, the divergent and the convergent, all these things, different kind of uh, horn, horn structure, like, sorry, the dust structure. Then uh, according to their curves and things, we can easily come to, like, we can at least, uh, uh, will not have misidentification of certain individuals who are creating a conflict. Uh, then the, when we talk about all these things, we also can talk about the year, uh, tier in the wild, in, in the field when the animals are fight or animals trying to come you know, for the dominance, they have a year, year tier, uh, body marks are there. So it can be easily recognized on that particular part. So all these things can be utilized to see like what are the best uh, suitable position can be identified of particular individual. When we, when we see about identification and when we know okay this is the population that is creating a problem then first first of all getting into too much of mitigation measures what is the uh, what is the concern scenario what what do elephants face today there's a main about disease in the field each and every individual might have a disease but we but in a wild scenario it will be not be known properly until unless we doesn't have a clear uh, uh, study on that especially on disease pattern there are few talks already have been made by dr bindu madhavi and few other uh, uh, senior colleagues on especially on disease and health component, it will be very easy when we match about these things. Like disease plays a crucial role in like uh, to represent uh, species in that particular area. Then the anthropogenic pressure, the habitat loss, then the fragmentation, all these leads to uh, certain things where the how do we come out with all these things to have a proper conservation for this particular individual? And over that, then the game hunting plays a crucial role. Still, it's there, like the illegal hunting, we say. Is for, for the ivory, which has been highly uh, hunted in other uh, European countries, they, they still uh, look for uh, ivory, elephant ivory, especially for Asian elephant ivory. So when we talk about all these things, where do this conflict occur? Like, like when we talk about the modern problems, how do, when when there's a problem, we have to have a solution. How do we come to a solution? It's not about uh, we, we, we don't want to come to a solution that is like for us for a, a short period of time. We have to have a solution, ecological based solution for a longer period of time where this population can be surveyed for a longer time with a smoother thing. When we talk, when we talk about these things, when three things were popped out, like the problem is inside the forest, 
then the inside the human area and inside the interface. Like when we show these kind of picture, it will not give a clear idea. When there's a picture like this, it will give a clear idea where this population comes from. When there is a human wildlife conflict problem comes inside the forest and the interface and outside the forest area. So the problem might be unique, but the mitigation measures should be different. We, we can't have a similar mitigation measures for all the three scenarios. When we do, when we do similar kind of scenario, it might work in few patches, but it might not work in future. So that's how we have to have a certain uh, ecological based or our area specific uh, medication measures and plans to come out of these conflict situations. When we talk about all these things, when there is a forest patch, which is very close to agriculture forest, how do we come out for, to have a solution for this kind of habitat where animals will animals will easily come into the agriculture use area where there is very close to the forest area. But when we talk about all these things, before that, there is a forest patch. Agriculture, there is an agriculture forest patch, there is an elephant habitat. How do we come out? Then we have an elephant proof trench and we have solar to trench over the uh, hanging hanging solar panels. Uh, all these things come comes into play. But whether we have an effective way of that, I'll be showing you images on that. How do we come out with this modern problem? What are the main drivers before getting into those pictures? What are the modern uh, drivers like when talk the main thing that the habitat loss? Like each and every landscape faces this in the habitat fragmentation, in the habitat defragmentation. Challenges of mitigations are very unique. It, it depends upon uh, the resource and the fund, like all these things plays a usual role because everybody knows like what is happening in today's elephant conservation, right? Like we have to have a long-term strategy rather than having a short-term policy. If you have a short-term policy that, that might work for a certain period of time, but it not work for a longer period, then we have to have a different strategies for that. So all these things, right? then we have the, low, the local overabundance of population, whatever it is. So when we talk about this habitat, I showed a picture before when uh, where there is an elephant habitat, there's a coffee plantation, then they have a trench over there. Where is the we or these space crucial rule where this habitat degradation forest remains where we where we use the forest resource much more compared to the animals? Then it all these things will lead to fragmentation where for our economical needs to, to fulfill the economical needs and other resources, we create our parts where the animals are getting struggled. But the animal might have not known that there's a new order happened because these have been they, they use a large vast area, an average uh, home range for like an elephant for trees and collared individuals, which we do in food. We had a uh, minimum home range of uh, Earth is like 120 to 130 square kilometer, and the Tusker is having around more than 200 to 20, like only in Kuduku. But that's my personal uh, experience that we had a coloring data over there. So imagine about 200 to 50 square kilometer, like we have roads and other trenches, all these things. So this is like, it's a simple thing how these animals come into conflict. Then when we talk about all these things, then the when we talk about like where do these problems arise and how do we get involved with these things, right? Uh, when we talk about the main thing, when we talk about HEC's human wildlife conflict, your human elephant conflict, then we have to have a proper mitigation measure. When we talk about uh, proper mitigation measure, we always think about forest department should give the mitigation measure. But until and unless the forest department is not getting a support from civil society, community, NGOs, research institute, and many other people, naturalists who works on who are personally to work on animals and species and conservation, and they have best, better technology to have a mitigation measures to be involved with them. And we other than this, we also should involve the law enforcement, where this play a crucial role where other different sectors or other things. And we also have a civil administration should be deeply involved in when we're writing a plan or something. We should also involve community agency where the civil administration could have a direct uh, involvement with community development agencies. When we talk about this interlink when community development agencies, we should also have a community interlink with the local areas, with the farmers, plantation owners, all those things. So when these three merge together, where it will also be lead to wildlife and its habitat. Whether this is an wildlife habitat, whether it's an agriculture area, all these things will come into play in that role. When this wildlife habitat comes on, then the then we have. Uh, we it will lead to a different agency with the infrastructure development agencies with a plan to have a development plan. When we have all these resources pulled together to mitigate a human wildlife conflict, we might have a better strategy to mitigate a human wildlife conflict. But we should not forget how this media plays a crucial role. Where, where do all these things can to, to be exposed? Who will be exposing all these things? We will be not talking to each and every At least if there's a paper news, 
like it will be reaching for 100 people or 200 or 300, maybe like thousands of people. Media as a main agency, media should be involved in each and every sector of the things. We have to carry the good news to a certain part of the level. When we talk about this thing, like we have uh, different types of barriers, right? We have already mentioned we have solar power fence, uh, elephant proof trenches, hanging solar fence, like hanging, like now it has been designed to one multiple layer, one, two, three, four layer of hanging solar fence. And then the modern thing is the railway barricade. Do all these barricades uh, have a successful but up to a certain level of need? Does these barricades uh, has where to where to deploy all these barriers and where to be uh, uh, placed all these barriers? And we also talk about animal behavior ecology into consideration. Have we considered this? No. Like we we should we should also think when we uh, talk about uh, only conservation techniques. We should also talk think about animal behavior. We should also consider ecology before we creating a, uh, a solution or before we come to a solution. So when we talk about railway barricade that has been actively implemented in court, in court, in court, landscape, which I've been worked, just like it has its own uh, uh, problems, uh, the, the, the water logging areas, or the roads which has been to use to transport between uh, inside the forest and outside forest areas. Uh, so it's a huge investment. So there's a cost wise, this is like effective, but uh, it's, it's, an, it's an effective uh, barricade, but cost wise, it's like, it's a huge thing. And only those barricades, when we do these barricades in certain points, like where there's a landslide area, where there's a water logging area, we have to have a different construction thing, like there is a pillar should be developed, there's a concrete wall should be developed. All these things takes a huge toll on the landscape and, and movement of animal. Then the common thing, what we do is like, we call as EPT, it's called as elephant proof trench, which has been more successful. Uh, but this elephant proof trench has its own uh, way of uh, damage. When we talk about uh, the damage, it has its own natural based damage. Other, other heavy was started moving in this uh, trench area. They started using these uh, sands, started uh, coming down, the soil erosion, we can say. When these, these, these are the weaker points where the elephant might target and move out of. Once we, we say that the elephant poop has been developed, then the animal, an animal might not come. But I promise you, elephants are much more smarter. They think in a larger way. And there's a natural breakage in EPT. It's, it's a common thing. What's a natural phenomena? How does it come? So there's a rain flow, there's a soil erosion, where it closes all the uh, closes the weak point of the uh, uh, EPT breakers, where the animal uh, move. There's a sign you can see in the second image. You can see the signs where the elephant, especially uh, uh, identifies the spawns and crosses this particular area. Then, when we create an EPT for a two to three kilometer, or maybe for five kilometer, there has this natural presence, like presence of rocks under the soil, in which like digging an EPT is like it's impossible. And thinking and bringing a wall over there or bringing a uh, railway barricade is really impossible to on these particular areas. So all these things should be considered when we have these plans. And this is a this is a clear indication how this the water flows and where it has been logged out and how the animals will be using. So this picture indicates like. It's like, it's a solution, but it's not. So all these things makes certain areas, I'm not saying all the areas, all these things makes this design, do we think it's a poor design? I'll say it's not a poorly designed, but in certain areas, as it has been poorly implemented, I will say, rather than a poor design, I'll say poorly implemented in certain areas where the animal used to come. And this also, one more thing, this also damages few elephants. Like few elephants I could be able to see in Kodugu, they uh, break their legs when they cross, they want to force, they have been forced to cross these areas, the tusker, the lone tusker, which is roaming around in and around. They, uh, they try to cross, but uh, one or two individuals have broken their legs and it's little to moderate. So this also like things about how do we, Manage these kind of situations, and for our needs, for our needs, we create a weaker point where animals easily identify those points. These are the images which have been animals as well. They are very clever. They cross this particular point. All these things come, and they are beautiful learners. They are absolutely beautiful learners. I have been one evidence to prove that the animal, especially identified a weak point of the railway barricade where there's a two joint, this parallel joint. This animal identified exactly on that particular point and broke, break the railway barricade and crossed over. So that's like in the night time. That was a radio collared elephant, so we could be able to track that. And in the night, it's around 12, 13, and one o'clock, we were with a new steam and it was like big sound. Then we approached there and we from a safer distance, we were watching. And animals were easily crossing. So that's why I'm saying it's a learning ability of animals are much higher. 
when we talk about all these learning abilities, we also easily cross the solar phase, the damage the solar phase. But we have only uh, current scenario is only to deploy or to uh, install a solar panel. But we still not in a stage where we, how do we maintain the solar panels and how long we'll be maintaining this. All these things still in a question. Then uh, still uh, certain areas and high risky areas are things and people still uh, try to uh, manage this, but there is problem on day to day basis. So when we talk about all these barriers and problems, these animals are easily coming out to have a crop damage. They have to cross a particular area or there is there is certain area that is easy, easy for us available or the water, the water areas are available easily. So they come out uh, to have the water. So they across the uh, accidentally cross these agriculture parts in few landscapes where they damage the properties, the arachnid trees. There is a one picture in the bottom of if you can uh, to see this with the dung, with the coffee seeds. Uh, now, initially, uh, with, with the survey which I had in court, the people used to say initially they cross, that's it, they, they damage one or two trees and we are happy for that and they cross it. But now they started eating the coffee seeds. So that is high risk. You now they are also thinking that the animals are adapted to have this. Uh, Food in their diet. So, this is an indication that they are also eating the coffee seeds. Now, the plantation owners are really in a worry like how to, how to come, come over this. Then, it's not about the property damage or something, it's about the economy, the economy, the, the, the damage which has been caused in a vast way. How do these people come over this? Like, it's an economic thing, right? It's a cultural thing, it's a regional thing, like three to four months, they have put in a hard work and it's entirely destroyed in, in one overnight of time. And this place, like, I'll, uh, like, Psychological things which comes into people's mind, and uh, of course, this is the today's scenario. This is the current scenario, and I think this is the future. Like how do farmers will cope up with us? Sorry to show this picture, but today's scenario is like this. What is the problem? They are facing this. They are coming to the dump garbage areas. This is the right hand images of from the field area. And the one of, now the recent paper has been published by Gitanjali Katlam from Uttarakhand. Rajaji are not mentioned. I was, I was remembering to mention that paper here. I was sorry, I forgot to so that I can share a link in the group also. Uh, that has been clearly indicated how this elephant, like there are like more than 100 uh, plastic spit has been found in elephant dung. So that is like a huge number, right? Half of the plastic might have come out and half of the things might have been inside the animal. So this scenario should, should change and we should also think in like next step of conservation, how do we use this proper disposal of waste management in wildlife areas? Not in wildlife areas, rather than in human use area also, because animals are mostly using the their human area. So when we talk about all this, like how this elephant being there and how what is the problem we are facing currently and what is the future version for us? If you if you see that if you see these three images, nobody will say no. We will say yes to these images. Out of 90% we will say yes. The past, how this animals and how does they move in the forest areas? And what is the current scenario? We have been forced. We are saying this elephant, you have to walk in this path. That's not will happen. We have divided the habitat into two, like A and B. And the future scenario, I promise you, if we are not taking a note at this particular point, or we're not taking a stand at this particular point, we'll be, we'll be forced to say that the elephant, you have to stay here. That's the, that's the scenario that will happen. But for that, do we have a proper uh, solution? How do we come up, come up with this? So we have to think about the future version and think about this thing. When I, when I talk about this thing, this is what is happening in few landscapes. At the edge of the forest, it has been, uh, it has been started the developmental activities and all these things have been going around. When you talk about development activities, other than that, agriculture also happening, where the illegal uh, electric fence is happening. There is a certain uh, walls and power should be used in the solar fence, but they are using it directly. So this is a this is a critical thing that we should be uh, should be thinking in a different way and should be considered. When we talk about all these things, there's uh, electrification things is happening, the uh, highest thing is happening. But we say uh, less hearted people use this opportunity and take their enemies. So this is happening. This is the current scenario. Which is and uh, yeah, doesn't want to call this, but yeah, I thought we'll just prove that we'll say what is happening with the rail uh, with the rail collision 118 elephant. This is the old data of the reason before 2020. So this is the data that has been given like in uh, a period of years with uh, 120 elephants have been dying with the rail collision because it's a sorrow site for us. So what do what do comes in mind when we talk about this modern like this is a huge animal this, this having enormous ecological significance and supporting so many species they which which they live around what how do we come out with these problems like do we have a proper solution or we or what are the frameworks should we work on this 
So when we talk about the first thing is about uh, restoration of habitat, habitat, but it's a limited scope, but we can done on a critical area where we can high critical areas. Like when we talk about a tiger reserve, yeah, the same like the elephant reserve should be highly thing and the elephant corridors and the priority area should be highly a um, prioritized uh, for these country for habitat restoration. When we talk about the restoration and the resourcing work and the quality and the uh, other uh, habitat improvement, what can be done? For example, removing seeds and making the available fodder grasses. <coughs> Sorry, other things. When we talk about this restoration of habitat, I think it also talks about the restoration of connectivity of fiber patches from one landscape to another landscape. For example, this uh, when it is clear debate about color fiber or color card fiber in southern part. But all these things can be seriously considered and we can move forward. And, and the other things, how do we manage? When we talk about there's an area which has been highly, like it's a overpopulated of elephants, how do we manage about this? Then we talk about the sort of elephants it's killing, like there's no other option. Then we can capture these individuals and bring into captivity. Maybe one reason, but how long we'll be doing that? We have to have a big question on that. Then maybe we have a problem, then we can talk about the translocation. So when we talk about all these things, whether the translocation gives a proper solution, well, say like I've been worked in that translocation part for 10 to 12 years, and I've been worked on God translocation. I have a, like, like a small bit of experience how this translocation works. I'll be having that explanation maybe later on. And what are the main solutions we do about to protect these things and the modern problems? How do we solve it? When we talk about this modern problem to solve these things, then we talk about crop guarding, the fire, the fire management, supplement of traditional crops. Uh, plans like uh, and we and, and uh, we have an organ uh, like organized crop protection scheme that can be highly categorized and can be can be locally implemented and things and the RIT teams can be given with patrolling vehicles and the elephant barriers and ecological when we talk about yeah, elephant barriers and ecological uh, uh, barriers can be given and then when we talk about the solution we also talk about the physical solution where they work wire fences, log of stone fences, bridges, and biological. So all these things can have an ecological correlated or conservation scenario of physical barriers. Then what are the other things? When we talk about electrical fence, electrical fence, people are still it's in the using in a legal way. We have to think about that. Then clearing for boundaries are two key images. That's a clear indication how the forest has been degraded as of now. Then the buffer crops and unpalatable crops. When we when we use about an unpalatable crop, then that should be economically affordable to the uh, to the villagers or the farmer community to uh, to move forward to the next step. Then when we talk about translocation, whether all the like whether herds can be translocated or individuals can be translocated. So everything should be discussed in a such a way. Everything should be organized and planned in such a way to before we move forward. And certain things when we talk itself, like this is this individual is creating a clear problem when we identify that individual and it's, when we have a monitoring of certain period of time, then we can do that. And also we can do a problem with like radio coloring of monitoring this individual that can be done as what we, what we are doing in poor. And the restoration of connectivity patches. So all these things will will might or will come to a solution or will uh, will move to the next step of elephant conservation. So with this words, I'd like to complete that. The fate of this great super creature truly lies in man's hand and it's man's ability to provide for its ecological needs in man-dominated environment. These words have been said by Hans Steiger in 1976. So if I, if I show this picture, the God and elephant, I have been working on God and currently working with elephants. This is like the size doesn't matter, but the ecological value is more important for the species. So I'll just stop here and thanks for your patience listening. So we'll have a further queries and questions that I'll take up on later. Thank you. Hi. So, uh, yeah. so I'm done with my presentation. So Matthew or yeah, yeah, I'll go, I'll go on. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, Ashna has introduced everyone earlier. Okay. So I think I'm supposed to go. Yeah, I'll go. Hi everyone. This is Pradeep. And thank you so much, Navani, then for that wonderful presentation. So though it was like 70 slides, but of course we need to have that because you no, know, you have come up with a topic about like Ancient sorry, I have taken more time, but I thought I'll not come up with not short time. But yeah, of sorry course, for that. When we are talking about the modern problems, we need to come up with solutions. Of course, we get to see you know a lot of solutions you are trying to, and the vision you are trying to you know show the people that what is going to be in the future scenario about elephant conservation in India. 
and what one needs to plan if we need to try to really you know, mitigate the solutions. Yeah, thank you, Navneet. Thank, thank you, Pradeep. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will just share my screen in a bit. Now, is everyone able to view my screen and then my voice is audible? Yeah, it's perfect. Voice is audible. Yeah. Shall I proceed, Ashna, or you want to pitch in something? Yeah, uh, yeah, you can go on now. Okay. So my slides, like, you know, I've got 19 slides, but it's very packed. So I'll just talk about the species because Navdi then has introduced about elephants across, ranging across all of Asia, and in particular about Indian scenario and what he is actually uh, trying to do in WWF as an elephant specialist, conservation specialist. So actually, I work on the species called Nidgirita. So my title is like a wild captainy. Why I'm emphasizing as a wild captainy in the Western Ghats is we have got a lot of captainies in India. So, but the only captainy that we find in Western Ghats is the Nidgirita. So that's why I just want to you know, emphasize that this is the only wild captainy in the Western Ghats. So uh, until 2005, you know, we believe that there are three Thar across the world, Arabian, Himalayan, and Nilgiri Thar. So in 2005, this couple of people, Wapikwet and Hassanin, did some molecular phylogenetic studies. Until 2005, everybody thought, because on, based on morphology, we live to be you know, under the same genus. That is the heavy travis. So then they have actually, you know, uh, did some phylogenetic studies and they get to see that all these three TAR is not similar, each, uh, similar with each other genetically. So they proposed actually, you know, three different genera for three different uh, TARs. So actually all these TARs are uh, uh, put it in monotypical genera, especially Arabian and the Nilgiri TAR. Uh, Himalayan tar is still continuing with the Hemitragus genera. So now it is like Nilgiri tar is under Nilgiri tragus genus, Arabian tar is under Arabitragus genus, and Himalayan tar is under Hemitragus genus. So this is a map of how this three different tar species is distributed globally. So what we get to see is that on the top, this blue thing. No? This dark blue patch, this is the distribution of Himalayan tar in the wild. Actually, apart from this, we have got an introduced population in New Zealand, which is close to 7,000, 8,000 tar, which is available in the Alps Mountain. So that's the distribution of Himalayan tar. And we have got the distribution of Arabian tar in the UAE and Oman Hill. And what we get to see in the pink in the southernmost area of Tamil Nadu and Kerala in the western parts is a scatteredly distributed population. So that's our Nilgiri tar. So just for your information, it's a basic taxonomical classification of this species. Of course, it's we belong to the kingdom Animalia, which is all all animals fall under this kingdom. Our data is, of course, we know all animals with the backbones called is called falls under chordata class is mammalia any animals with mammary glands so that falls in the mammalia so order from here if you get to see there are you know, ungulates are kept under two orders one is osteodactyla and another one is perisiodactyla osho is ungulate which has even toes so it has you know, even toes the toes which is made up of either two or four so even toed ungulates are called are placed under order, Ashiodactyla. This falls in the family Bovide, all bovines, you no know, cattle and everything comes under Bovide. Subfamily Caprine, Caprine, which we have, have all goats and sheep species. Nilgiri tragus is the single genus. It's a monotypic genera, one genus, one species. Hylocrius is the species. So if we talk about the conservation significance of the species, you know, so this is an endemic to Western Ghats, as I've already told you, and it's also a state animal of Tamil Nadu. So right uh, from my introduction, uh, 
I mean, the top title. No? It's as a only member of the subfamily Caprini that is formed south of Himalayas. Because, you know, the 11, 12 species that are found in India are mostly in the Himalayas. This is the only subfamily, uh, only species from the subfamily Caprini that is found in the Western Himalayas. So it mostly occupies, you know, uh, grassland and cliffs, which are primary water, uh, source of water catchment areas. So that's one uh, important thing that we actually, you know, try to underline here. It is also when we come across the protection status, you know, it is also pro uh, protected under Schedule 1 of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. Also, it is categorized as endangered by the IUCN. So it is uh, categorized as under a uh, Category C2A1. C2A1 is basically, you know, uh, individuals with lesser population, lesser adult individuals, and you know, habitat with uh, broken habitat, and the extent of habitat is getting strengthened over the period of years. So, under these category, it is placed under uh, endangered by IUCN. So, this is a typical uh, tar habitat. Roading grasslands with cliffs and pocket shoulders. This is in, in Greece. So what we get to see, you know, so Varayade, as I was talking earlier, so it's this name, you no, know, Varayade in Tamil or Malayalam. So actually, the Nilgiri Tar in Tamil or Malayalam, it's called as Varayade. Varay is actually, you know, meaning of literally trans uh, uh, translate to cliff or precipice, you no know, rocky precipice or cliff. So, Ardu means it's goat, goat to the mountain or a rocky cliff area. So, that's why it's, as you get to see, you know, it can as easily, you know, negotiate cliffs. So, it's basically a cliff dweller. I'll just take you, you know, some information. It's an herbivore animal which feeds, you know, mostly on plants, uh, ranging from, you know, lichens to herbs, shrubs, grasses to tree species as well, to some extent. So, you know, uh, it uh, feeds on a variety of plants. So, when we get to see, you know, it's uh, biology, so uh, rutting, this, the breeding season is when we get to see, it's almost observed during monsoon. That's mostly during June to August, it breeds. And uh, after a gestation period of 180 days, almost like sheep, you know, for uh, six months, it has gestation period. A calving, because rutting is during June and August, calving, you know, after the six months, it's supposed to be between January to March. Usually, you know, it gives birth to only one young, very rarely two, but mostly it's one. So when we get to see, this animal can actually live up to 12 years in wild conditions. That, you know, if it escaped from predation, if it escaped from disease, if it escaped from natural death. So it can live up to 12 years in wild conditions. But average lifespan, no, because there's a lot of mortalities happening in the younger age. So average lifespan in the wild is somewhere around three and a half years. However, no, when we get to see, these animals tend to live more than 20 years in captive conditions. Now we don't have any uh, individuals in captive conditions in India, but we had uh, during 80s, so in Trivandrum Zoo and, all, and a, few, a few individuals was taken to the US. Now, I think there are some five to seven individuals under a private ownership in the US. Earlier, it was in Minnesota Zoo, but now they have given it to a private ownership. But that doesn't look like a tar anymore. It's like, you know, more bulky and all its shape is different. So one good thing from all these things, what we get to see is that because from a population of four individuals, after a period of 40 years, there are still four, five to seven individuals surveying what it actually uh, Try to you know uh, for us to get, understand is that inbreeding depressions are low in Nilgirita, which is a good sign. Maybe if we need to do an you know, in situ conservation, so inbreeding depressions are low. That is what we get to see. But we don't have any population of Nilgirita in uh, zoos or in captive condition across India. We don't have. So when, comparatively, when we get to see morphologically, you know, these males can actually, you know, weigh up to 100 kilograms, which is, you know, double the size when you get to see in the body. But females, you know, can grow up to like, we can weigh up to around 50 kilograms. And when we talk about its height, so it's like 100, close to 100, 105 centimeter at shoulder level, males can grow. And females up around 
80 centimeters. So when I've told you, no, it uh, feeds on different varieties of plants ranging from light plants, plants, grass, herbs, herbs, trees. So we have observed more than 120 different species of plants. So what we actually get to see is that it can survive anywhere in an open grassland with a cliff. In. So that is what our depth. So if we literally want to translate, you know, like uh, what is the requirement for a tar to survive is an extent of open grassland habitat with, you know, potential cliff areas. Cliff is mainly for survival aspect. When there is a predation pressure or any kind of threat, these animals run into cliffs. So that is why it's rightly named as, you know, cliff goat. So, So uh, uh, what we actually did from 2007 to 2013, because we didn't have you know proper uh, kind of idea about what is its exact distribution, what would be its actual population, how is the connectivity is there between these population, all those things we tried to study from 2007 to 13. So we have come up with all these distribution sites, all these white dots. You know, we get to see you know uh, records of Nilgiri Tar present in all these areas. So based on all these distribution sites, actually, you know, and uh, it's home range. We presumed home range. We followed few herds and from past historical studies, we get to know that it can use up to, you know, like uh, 12 to 17 square kilometer of area a herd can use. So all those uh, information we have put into a GIS and we try to, you know, delineate into different conservation blocks. We thought that this population with falls within different blocks cannot be presumed that it cannot move into different blocks. So that's what maybe in our future, if we do some radio telemetry studies, if we get to see the movement, then we can understand. But otherwise, we have as of now, we have divided into five conservation blocks. Nilgiri Hills here. It will have somewhere around 600 individuals. Sirwani Hills, around 200. And then this major block is high range and Palni Hills, close to 1,500 individuals. And we have the Srivili, Puturte, and Eternal Valley Hills. The southernmost tip we have got, KMPR and National Province. All these bracketed numbers, no, the uh, around uh, rough population in the blocks. So another study what we did with uh, WII is to try to look at the population genetics of this Indian bulls. So what we get to see is that there is this barrier, no, this yellow yellow gap here. This is this Palgat gap. So this Palgat gap is actually playing a barrier in terms of uh, population genetics as well. So what we get to see is that there is a clear divergence of uh, genetics, I mean population genetics between individuals from the north of Palgat Gap and south of Palgat Gap. So there is a clear divergence from, yeah. May I request everyone to put your uh, speakers on mute, please, in the microphone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I could hear some voices. So then on, after that, what we actually tried to do is that we have actually surveyed all those areas. We get to know what is the population. We have actually mapped the size of the, each of the habitats. So each of the habitat we tried to map and we tried to you know, see. There are a number of fragments. Extent is where the population is still present. At, uh, I mean, like uh, 2021, we did all these surveys. So this is current scenario. We have got a population in 101 fragments, which is coming up, contributing up to 798 square kilometer. Possible extent is that we presume that these are adjoining areas of the surviving uh, habitats. So there could be a chance of these uh, 101 population from these 101 fragments can go up to this 120, may use this 22 more fragments. So that will contribute around 60 square kilometer. And we have also tried to you know, evaluate and see what are the areas from where population had gone extinct from the past, recent past. I mean, in in earlier sense, what they're talking about is that uh, in one literature uh, during 1950s, they described that there had been tar in Karnataka uh, somewhere in 1950s. One conservator of forest, uh, I mean, uh, have recorded presence of 
are in Karnataka, some parts of Karnataka. But as of now, we don't have. But these extinct areas, these eight fragments and possible 18, cl or close to 20 fragments, so these extinction have happened in the last four or five decades. We have got information, but this map is not clear. So that these, these yellow kind of thing, no? these one, these are all extinct areas. So we have actually mapped out the extinct areas in different blocks. So this is what we have done recently. So from based on all this information, we have actually tried to, you know, put what are uh, what would be the challenge conservation challenges for the species. So we have actually tried to, you know, put it into a few of these points. So one is like fragmented populations. So because when we get to see, you know, uh, there are, you know, many population that has, you know, less than 20 individuals. It can happen because if some disease come, if maybe something happened, no? so easily that small population can be wiped out. So then that is one. And second reason is that this is isolated and it is fragmented. So there are chances for poaching, no? easy chances for poaching can also can happen. And because there is no connectivity to the main tar areas. So that's one thing. And second thing, what we get to see, because this species actually tend to live in an open space. It doesn't move into forested areas. So what actually happens is when the grasslands, because of our earlier uh, policies, because people at uh, forest managers, and then they thought that uh, for the grasslands are wastelands and then try to plant with eucalyptus, water, pine tea, all those things, you no know, change in vegetation. So that has you know, uh, made uh, shrunken their habitat and uh, restricted Nilgiri Thar to you know, uh, live in the cliff and grassland areas. So that has become another one reason for you know, forest fire is a huge debatable uh, uh, kind of uh, topic because some argue that it is actually good for you know uh, good for fresh fodder and nutrient recycle all those things. Some argue that it eliminates uh, local flora, my, micro fauna, flora, and everything. So it's a debatable thing. I haven't... Uh, and there are other anthropogenic pressures which plays a minor role, like overgrazing by cattle, unsustainable minor forest produce collection, overstaying for a period of two, three months and doing MFP collection, encourage forest encroachment, pilgrim tourism in the mountains. So all these things. And lack of ecological understanding for conservation planning. So that all we have actually tried to put it as challenges. And now, so uh, we have got permission in Tamil Nadu. We have actually categorized all these threats. We have put minus forest produce, livestock grazing, temples, water enforcement, estate, state settlements, invasives. We have, this is all the divisions that are given. And we have tried to see, because forest fire is talking now, followed by, you know, invasives. And then with minus forest produce. So we are trying to, you know, bring up some solution to reduce these pressures. These pressures are not actually affecting directly to the individuals, but in a small way, it is uh, affecting. So we are trying to minimize all these pressures. And additional one challenge, what we are getting to uh, see these days is that there are you know, some abnormal body swellings we are um, observing in uh, different individuals at different places. You can see at the back, you can see on the face, you can see on the belly area, on the leg. And some cases I have seen observed in an udder also. So we actually wanted to address this challenge as well. So this actually we have recorded. So a total of 19 individuals across during our 2021 survey across all these sites, like nine from Mukurti, Nilgiri's four, Godamur, all these numbers, you know, we have got numbers. Because we had got permissions only in Tamil Nadu, we have actually did it in Tamil Nadu. but Similar kind of observations are done in Kerala as well. Iravikulam, they have got three, four individuals with this abnormal swelling. So what we try to do is that we have actually now recorded all these, how many numbers, what is the problem, all those things we have uh, recorded. WWF is now actually collaborating with Tamil Nadu Forest Department, Madras Veterinary University. We have a collaboration to try to see what would be the cause for the swelling. So we have jointly did a preliminary field study and from you know some sample collections, so they've thought different reasons, and they have collected you know samples of carnivores because they that think that uh, sometimes from the carnivores cat, you no, know, there is this tinea multiceps assist 
which can be you know gone i mean it'll be there in the carnivorous cat which can actually go into grasslands or water bodies through the water bodies or grazing lands it can go into uh, these herbivores which can forms like these lumps so we have got evidence for that from indirect i mean like carnivorous cat also and then finally they found out that these are least likely to be malignant malignant like cancerous tumors no? because it will be you know lethal to them so but then now we have got you know permission from uh, chifile garden and from the uh, ministry to capture few individuals try to you know uh, collect the samples and find out what would be the reason of these abnormal swellings and to suggest corrective measures we are planning for it earlier on so in the meantime actually you know putting up all our challenges we actually you know worked out with tamil nadu forest department to come up with a project name krita similar to like project elephant or project tiger so we want you know a system for nilgiri tar so that you know an agency or you know an authority who will actually monitor this nilgiri tar and do some conservation planning so what we have uh, divided into you know four things which we need to actually try to address one is to have a better understanding of population distribution and ecology so what we need to really have is like you know synchronized surveys because we survey right from one by one by one by one so it's always good to have a synchronized surveys with you know standardized method across the range so that's all we need to do and we still we have got you know lot of ecological gaps uh, of uh, this uh, tar i mean like movement how where it's moving what are the barriers whether it can cross some areas and go or are there genetic connectivity still there all those things so no, this all can be addressed by radio telemetry studies we have planned for radio telemetry studies and since we have actually come up with you know the 20 fragments which is population got extincted from the recent past we wanted to try to you know reintroduce or maybe in some areas if we facilitate the movement from the existing area so that natural recolonization to this historical extinct sites can happen so all it's being planned so at least one or two sites uh, reintroduction we are planning for it with government here tamil nadu government and uh, third one is addressing known and emerging threats all these threats you no know, disease and treatment that we are planning and when we get to see threat because there is lot of uh, uh, habitat need to be restored because you no know, earlier this plantations lot of plantations have made these tar to be you know fragmented from each other so restoration work can actually you know happen uh, yeah, removing invasive species and restoring the habitat with grasslands so that can happen and obviously you know we need to try to build up uh, the capacity for the frontline staff in terms of like you no know, strengthening them in doing effective population enumeration different methods population monitoring all those things we need to do it so that is all put in another thing and general awareness because you know, if there is a day for tiger there is a day for uh, elephant there is a day for rhino everything there is a day for sparrow as well so if we declare a day for nilgiri tar i mean to talk about its significance so that will have add more value you know to increase awareness among common public also we are in tamil nadu we don't have much of ecotourism except for irvikulam we don't get to see tar in any of the tamil nadu areas so tamil nadu we are planning for ecotourism at few sites all these things we are planning for and the project needs so this is some challenges this is some solutions so what do we get out of it because this is a species which primarily live in shola grassland ecosystems so if we protect this tar obviously the shola grassland ecosystems are getting protected which you know directly augment and cater to our water needs because grasslands in a recent study it's understood that it store lot of water also you know evapotranspiration loss in forested areas water whether it is natural forest or plantation or whatever so evaporation evapotranspiration loss is reduced up to 10% so whatever uh, rain water it's harvested the evapotranspiration loss it's almost reduced to 10% so that there it also helps in carbon sequestration because even in case of fire 
because when forested areas get fire, all these carbon is again released to atmosphere because trees everything got burned. But in terms of grasslands, only the top area is burned, and mostly these grasslands stores a lot of carbon in their root system. So then the carbon sequestration, so that is not getting affected. So that is also another one reason. And also, obviously, we preserve associated small mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, insect plants, and fungi in the ecosystem. So it's basically, you know, it supports and enriches our life system. So this is a small talk about Nagarika. And if you want to have any queries you know, over mail, I have given my mail ID. So I mean, like, I'm happy to take question and answers here. But in future, if anybody wants to, you know, get to know some information or car or something, you can reach out to me in my email ID. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pradeep, for such an insightful talk. And thank you for bringing something new to the table. So now we'll move towards the conversation part between uh, Dr. Navin Tan and uh, Pradeep M.A. So may I ask Dr. Navin to unmute himself, please? Yes. So the topic of today's conversation is elephants and Nilgiri tar. Are they two distinctly different species, but have a common conservation concern? So please, you can begin now. Yeah. So I just to begin, of course, no, unless otherwise it's a different species, we are not going to call it as tar and elephant. <laughs> Because everybody knows it's two different, distinctly two different species. But the second part of the question, no common conser uh, conservation concerns. So maybe I'll talk about my view and get your views, or you go ahead with your views, Namita. No, but it, like you have recently concluded your talk, so you can just yeah. So my view, no, in terms of you know common conservation concerns. So when we get to see, when we know the biology of any species, for example, a large bodied species like elephant, definitely it needs around close to 200 liters of water. An adult elephant needs close to 200, water, 200 liters of water a day. So when we get to see association with tar, no? because if we need water, so tar is a species which actually lives in grasslands and cliff areas. So uh, in my talk, what I was trying to explain is that if we conserve this uh, tar, the grasslands in the upper altitude is getting conserved. When you conserve the grasslands, the water augmentation capacity becomes more. When there is a lot of water, a lot of streams happen, a lot of streams generate a lot of rivers, a lot of water. I mean, it is not directly, you know, when you conserve tar, they, they get water and that water is going to go for a utilization of elephant. But of course, when you conserve Nilgiri tar, you get to conserve a larger uh, Shola grassland ecosystem, which augments more water and which, you know, brings the perennial life on for all lives, not only for elephants, in all life. So that way, you know, actually we can get it connected. And other, other thing what I was thinking is that because grasslands are managed by these, I mean, high altitude grasslands, it this especially when you get to see this Caprine species, I mean, like uh, this four chambered uh, thing, you no know, ruminants, it actually grinds everything and it uh, these pellets are, you know, the fine nutrients with recycling materials. You know, it actually, you know, uh, recycle the grasslands because, for example, in plain area also, if you get to see if there are 200, 300 goats, they get take to into the farmlands and they, you know, pay the uh, person to make it halt there so that these pellets are deposited in the farmlands because easily all these nutrients are getting recycled. So, tar actually manages this grassland to get this nutrient recycled. So, that is one thing. And at the same time, when we get to see, Elephants actually, you know, manages the low, uh, low elevated areas. forest areas with in terms of recycling at in terms of, you know, creating paths for other lives for, uh, for every aspect. No, so that is what I am thinking as, you know, common conservation concern. And at the same time, 
if you conserve the species, if you conserve elephant, it's not only elephant getting conserved, all the associated species awesome. and the habitat as well. If you get to conserve this Nilgiri car, the habitat, the ecosystem is getting conserved. At the same time, no, associate the small herb, herbivores, reptiles, mammals, uh, microfauna, everything is getting conserved. So that is what, you know, that interlink I'm trying to, you know, establish. Maybe you can put in your points, your thoughts also. No, but that is uh, very, very well uh, So like a simple thing, you know, you live in the mountains and I try to live near to the mountains. Yeah. So that's the thing. <clears throat> so no, we, but... we surround living the mountains. We just associate it to cover the mountains and you being the top and giving the water. Like when we talk about the Nilgiri Thar conservation, yeah, the point and what you said is like, it's an amazing uh, points to the conservation scenario. Like, and all not valid, like much more, much valid points and brings very new sites uh, to this group. To, to add to those points, like elephants has its own uh, uh, problem. Like, but the problem with, uh, the habitat degradation, all these comes in a common scenario. But elephants are a little bit of unique with the body size and structure. It has this unique way of adaptability. You have to adapt to a different uh, habitat or vegetation types of things. But tar, can, tar being a thing, it can be has an uh, height psychology. It can go to the hillocks and try to survive from the predators of things. But for elephants, that scenario is like for their survival and stuff. It has to cross the corridor. Like it has to come to a forest or it has to be in a forest. It has to cross the city now. That is the scenario to, to be open up. But uh, when you talk about the grassland conservation things, uh, wherever there is a uh, with our population it's associated with, I think the population, they have water connectivity. These things have such a huge impact on the population. But wherever there is not the grassland, is like not much more in the uh, landscape or not much more in the habitat, then it faces like because uh, elephants also need grasslands, like in the high number, they also need grassland. They prefer living in grassland areas. Those grassland areas now are modified into agricultural habitat. So they are trend to go into the agricultural habitat because all these grasslands or the, all the low-lying areas, such as being previously it was like maybe a water logging area or maybe maybe the grassland areas. Now the, the villages peoples are being there and now they want to take up those things uh, and the cultural things place and uh, uh, the community part. They converted those low-lying areas into agricultural plantations. So these animals never go to an agricultural plantation or grassland. They, they, they know only that it's a food thing. They come across and they are there. So those things where the animal come into conflict area, like they come into conflict and get stuck. But there are two different things. When we talk about the herd living animals and the solitary bull, the problem is more about when the, when the group is coming, they, they're just destroying the plants and destroying the area and they move back into the forest. They never come ahead of that. But the solitary bull, when they leave the herd and want, trying to connect with the different herd from one, one, uh, one herd to other herd, where it comes at uh, crossing the area, like more the recently what we uh, what the work we're doing in uh, Climate tool, like we do a elephant survey, like the victim survey we did, and also like 80 85 victims we have covered myself and Rajan Musi and Skol and my colleague who are working on this project. 80 90 95% of the conflict happened with the single bulls, so that should be highly think about when we think about a plan or future scenario, like how do it comes in? Because we always talk about elephant herds create nuisance, and elephant herds create a problem. But it's not like that. It's when we get into the ground and talk to people and think about them, they are saying the herds are like, they just come and just move. They, they have calves and small young ones, like juveniles. They, they take care of them, they go back. They also listen. They also they also listen to the driving pattern. But for bulls, they are like they totally opposite. They are saying that is the more dangerous thing that comes in. At any point of time, it comes around. For the herds, they are saying they have a time pattern. They may be late night or maybe early morning. But these bulls are comes at 24 to 7, they, they can come out of any point of time. So these are the small, small issues that when we talk about in a bigger scale, it has a clear uh, scenario of, uh, of managing issues for the for the managers also. It's not only easy, like how it will be easy to talk for like, oh, we have to conserve, we have to do that and do that. But when we get into the ground and implement these activities to manage this, it's a, like, uh, that's why it's not only about the forest department or working with the research thing. It's about involving sectors of people, involving different stakeholders. So where all the stakeholders has have to bring together on the platform to know what is happening in the ground and how do we come out with a solution. 
For example, when we if there's a highway department or the railway department or the EB department or the water department, so everybody should be looped in uh, to move forward to the next step. It's not only about okay, forest department is coming and doing their own way of mitigation. No, we should not think in that way. But now forest department is doing a mitigation measure or they're trying to address a mitigation measure. That that means there are multiple sectors or stakeholders being involved, not directly, but indirectly they have been involved in this thing. So also you know, a few points if if I need to you know really connect the elephant with the car because generally we know that uh, like in the car are herbivore and I've told you like more than 120 species it's foraging upon a human and there's quite a lot of uh, plant species which elephants feed up that's one connectivity what we get to see and in another thing what I get to see you know other goat species generally we have in females we've got four teams, but in Nerikiri Tar, it has only two teams, which actually, you know, I mean, like, we cannot, you know, correlate it with uh, thing, but at the same time, you know, it's again, in case of elephants, females have only two teams. So that, you know, something which similarities, if we try to see, it's, that's one of the similarities, maybe like, it's not, you know, something like uh, to, I mean, some interesting things with that I just get to see is that Nelgiri Tar has also only two teeth and you know, females, mammary glands. So that's also another one point to actually, you know, try to see the similarities between these species. Yeah. Uh, but just one more, just ahead, one more thing which is running for a long period of time. Like, how does this grassland connectivity, where does this solar forest patch play a crucial role? How does the solar pockets play a crucial role in uh, conserving these grasslands? No, solar doesn't conserve grasslands, but solar uh, species, no, solar, this solar forest. It's such a unique vegetation type. So Shola is, this is like, you know, stunted, small, uh, evergreen uh, plants, I mean, trees, no? This combined together in the valley of these rolling grasslands is called Shola. Yes. So what, what this Shola is, you know, the unique about this ecosystem is that over a period of long time, it doesn't have any, you know, ev ev evolution. So it is not evolved much. So it's there. So that's why it is also known as climax community. The mm -hmm. And also the it sometimes, you know, when you get to see, you know, clouded forest, when the people say clouded forest, because it actually attracts moisture. These clouds come and these leaves actually attract that moisture. That actually that uh, droplets, it's also safe. So that's also a cloud, it's also connected as clouded forest. The Shola grassland has its unique, uh, you know, type of uh, vegetations. One thing, you know, with any other vegetation type, when you get into the sh uh, Sholas, you get, you know, close to like five to seven degree difference from the outside temperature. Okay. So, okay. yeah, yeah. It's five, seven, sometimes you get to see, you know, 10 degree. And always, you know, this, because sunlight is not entered, the humus layer is so thick, you have a lot of microbial activities. When you compare to any other different types of forest, the microbial activity under this Shola forest is so enormous. I mean, like, you know, it's many fold, then that soil is so much, you know, nutrient rich. So that's how the, the streams generating from there, you know, with water will have a lot of, you know, nutrient value, that water also generating from Shola grasslands will have a lot of nutrients also. So that way, you know, it's highly a complex and unique ecosystem and which is, you know, I mean, like a very important ecosystem to be conserved. So that's one. Yeah. Uh, so any, any, any uh, just want to for understanding, have you have any uh, focused observation or uh, presence of tar in that particular patchy areas of uh, solar parts? Some, some studies, you know, they say that actually, you know, when there are uh, small patches of sholas, some studies and some report and some people say that they actually process this shola and get to other areas. I have also seen, okay. but in general, like any other species like, you know, Sambar deer, bucking deer, or in low elevated areas, chital, 
or any other forest uh, species no so it doesn't use shola or any other forested areas but it mostly prefer open areas sometimes very rarely but i have got observation of it crossing from one end and crossing to the other end within minutes what it actually says that it is not staying inside the shola it just moves through the shola and goes to the other area so all these interesting insights or information we are trying to plan to you know do some radio telemetry radio color of you individuals we have observed we have obtained permissions once we do this radio telemetry studies we will have insights on what would be the barriers whether it is crossing sholas or plantation tea estates based on that we may you know sometimes just need to facilitate you know some uh, removal of invasives and restoration of habitat can actually facilitate movement of nilgiri tar from the existing area to the ex some of the extinct areas so that's in future maybe after radio telemetry study but in the meantime we are planning for reintroduction as well so that okay. yeah, that's yeah. that's really great that's wonderful that's wonderful like we like to see like your full publications on uh, yeah. this particular part of the reintroduction like what how does the animal behave because a unique kind of reintroduction right like So yeah. working on reintroduction of elephants and like sorry translocation of elephants and reintroduction of cow but it's a unique yeah. challenge what you will yeah. be facing now it's coloring also nobody has attempted the coloring for non exactly. elephants in india yes so yes. then it will be unique That's kind of true. challenge and yeah. it will be like the insights what you will be getting it will be amazing for conservation and for this yeah. uh, management plan what we prepare for the future yeah. so, yeah. so, we hope so, so it's all is fingers crossed yeah. <laughs> Yeah, always. Yeah, but hopefully by this year, I think you might uh, do this. Yeah. Activity. Congrats for your team on making this effort on doing this. There's one more thing, but I just want to share this. Like when this time we start working on Coimbatore tour and what we going to progress in this thing. When when we talk about Coimbatore, this border of Bhutan Karagam Valley and the other side is like Manakar Forest Division. Yeah, it's it's, it's the same landscape. Any anyway, the uh, uh, like. The species is same elephant like the but we doesn't know the same individual is moving from the other land from this hill to other hill but we still still are trying to find out a ways how to uh, have a camera continuous camera trap monitoring because of the elevation because of the other uh, internal issues so i think but the total on uh, the other side of the hills is totally different thing where kerala department is mostly facing on crop riding issues but uh, in the coimbatore valley we are facing more on uh, human uh, Like injury and death issue, the crop rating is a little bit of less compared to the other side. So, like it automatically triggers out like, is this a unique uh, landscape? This uh, how does this uh, landscape has this uh, unique kindness of uh, problems? Like where just fifty, thirty, thirty to forty kilometers, if you travel and since the forest, you reach that particular area, but uh, where there is a crop high crop rating in the other part, and there is a different issue in the other side. so we just thinking about like how do we uh, come out with certain things to find out these kind of uh, issues so that there is a similar kind of population like until unless we doesn't know like we know what, what is the population size but is the same individuals are moving in this landscape so we just uh, still in the process of what we want to do in the forest stage and hopefully we might get some beautiful results uh, when we move forward with when we connect with two different forest divisions but yeah animals move without boundaries but still as a man made we have boundaries to work on this i just yeah. want to yeah, yeah i know i know i know about your work and this site specific approach will definitely yield you know better planning for this conflict mitigation of course yeah we are everyone interested to see you know what kind of results we are getting and how you know effectively we are trying to mitigate at least in this this particular hotspot yeah that will have some you know enlightenment in mitigation effectively mitigating problems yeah. thanks very much thank you but okay. one more thing i just want to have uh, this is this uh, of seeing your map that uh, the population has been distributed from the southern part till the nilgiris what, what do you think uh, like on the future thing like what is the uh, what is the future scope whether the population like how do the population can increase like Well, do we have any carrying capacity analysis kind of stuff? No, Or we have planned. Have... Yeah, we have planned for this population and habitat viability analysis. This time. In, in each and every yeah. block. Yeah, yeah. In each and every population. Yeah. Okay. Almost you know meta population we will try to do BHBA. Okay. So that's the idea. Isolated population maybe one or two we will try to see. But what we get to see from previous studies is that inbreeding depressions are low. 
unless if we do, so there's one question in the uh, chat box also about you know whether any reports of foot and mouth disease also so okay. unless something like foot and mouth disease outbreak happens in tar i mean like one uh, site actually but there is no proper documentation but one site reported to have an uh, fnm uh, outbreak and that population is wiped down some close to 13 to 17 individuals which we observed in 2013 and then it went as low as like two, three, and then that there we don't have any population, but it is you know not clearly documented because from the local information because it was an isolated population, and we knew that you know from the local uh, tribal people information that they say that it had some you know salivary things coming out of its mouth and few individuals dying on it. We were not, you know, at that point in time, there was no proper system to monitor it or document it. But yes, if there is an outbreak like FNM and all happens in uh, Nilgiri Tar in meta population, then probably, you know, the population can easily be wiped out. So, but that is what actually what we are trying to see is that when there is no inbreeding depression, if we try to establish the connectivity between this fragmented population to the meta population or the nearest population, a bright future, at least, no, whatever it is there, it's going to be there. And whatever habitat it is available, maybe we can try to, you know, bring in Nilgiri Tar to the available habitats. That's in near future. But apart from that, actually, one study has showed because of climatic conditions, uh, these habitat can actually, you know, get reduced up to 50% or, you know, like 30% in 2018, oh. 2080, 2080 and 2030. Okay. So that actually, I don't believe it because of these conservation measures, proactive conservation measures, especially, you know, from Tamil Nadu government side, one court order, one high court order is clearly saying that forest department are not supposed to plant eucalyptus anymore. No more plantation of eucalyptus. Nice, nice, nice. And they've actually come up with an invasive removal plan all across Tamil Nadu. That is also their court direction for removal of course of is on their own from village areas and many other areas that is there. And and the Tamil government. Nadu government is proactively planning for a 30 percentage of forest cover. So all those things. On top of that, we have got Project Nilgiri Tar, where we have proposed for invasive removal and restoration, all those things. If it happens at the you know uh, foreseeing rate, what we are projecting and foreseeing rate, probably you know a stable future is there for Nilgiri Tar, and probably we'll have you know Nilgiri Tar at a greater extent than what we have right. So that is what we are hoping for. And unless until if there is something like the FNM or something disease outbreak or something where you know small population get wiped out, but proactive measures can actually stop all those things. And maybe and uh, you know in situ facilitation can also be adopted, like you know few individuals in the zoo with the population from different, from different areas from different areas to back up with proper genetic uh, you know stock. So that will also help in you know conservation planning for Nilgiri Tar. Yeah. Uh, but one more thing, I just saw you the uh, photos which you showed with that kind of tumor. Yes. But like, yes. Uh, what what will be the next step on this? Like, what, how do you like have a broader plan on this? We have done some field investigation because uh, these veterinary people, no? so from Madras Veterinary University, Wildlife uh, Biology Department, and Central University Pathology Department, we have got you know quite a good collaboration and quite a good expertise team so we have taken them we have actually tried to you know uh, similar kind of observations they have seen in domestic uh, boats what they get to see is that there is one worm called tenia multiceps which is getting through the feces of carnivores especially this uh, dogs in cases of uh, domestic cattle so domestic goats what has happened is this feces as this tenia multiceps worm this cyst, which actually goes into water or grasslands, which goes uh, into uh, while foraging or drinking through the uh, to the body of this uh, ungulates, and mm. it forms a cyst. This is that cyst of that worm. 
actually what happens no so it is not actually lethal to the animal it can do all its activity but it's an abnormal swelling we perceive that it could be assessed and we try to you know analyze few of the uh, carnivorous cats but they get to see this actually warm from one of the cats and cyst also they presume that it could be this cyst if that is the problem then probably you know why it is coming with early nilgiri tar and not any other other species angulate, uh -huh. yeah angulate species so that they will actually plan they will take it to pathology they yeah, will automatically arise the question you know when we talk about this like uh, yeah. now, of course other species are also using it but yeah. And I don't think this sambar, yeah, sambar, sometimes sambar uses that area, bathing deer uses that area, and of course, gore is also there. Of course, gore is much more prone to this disease, so yeah, which so, is easily observed. Yeah, yeah. So we are planning for not only this, we are planning for this, you know, uh, viral load and this uh, whatever types of you know uh, pathological studies we will try to you know see. And because this is not only reported from Nilgiris, this is right from Nilgiris to Kanyakumari, everywhere it is happening. So we will try to address because we have got a capture permission also. And because of rains, we haven't started our work. We have found out a number of individuals. We are planning it in Nilgiris for the first to begin with. So we will try to capture one or two individuals, collect samples, do the pathological analysis, find out what would be the cause. And based on the suggestions from the veterinarian experts, we will go on for corrective measures. If these corrective measures happen at site level, then we will try to you know scale it up to site levels. Okay. Otherwise, we can actually try to prevent these you know uh, these in fact, I mean these sorts of uh, tumors happening to other individuals. If there are any preventive measures, we will try to actually immediately start up with preventive measures. Yeah. Ah, pretty like when uh, this uh, tumor is in with the species. So, with through all the, through the entire landscape, it's only on tar. Like in any other species that's been observed or abnormal activity has been reported in any of the uh, tar ranging area in that particular from the water department side. Uh, I mean, from uh, domestic point of view, you no know, domestic animal point of view, they have observed it in cattle like buffalo, cow, goat, sheep. All these things. Then, from domestic point of view. There is a lot of this uh, cyst load and everywhere from Masnagudi, all these regions we have also, I have also photographed and veterinarian also have observed. And there are some areas they have observed, there are some rashes kind of thing that is completely different from this. That somewhere from northeast or somewhere to some, uh, some species, that is also again some domestic species. They've observed some rashes kind of thing. They've shared a document with some published literature, but that has nothing to do with what is we are observing with tar in India. And other species, no, there are lumps we can actually, we have seen in elephants also. That is all not because of this. There are some body warts kind of thing we have observed in the elephants. That stays long, that, you know, sometimes used as individual identification for those animals. So that is not lethal and that is all together is lethal. So that is all my understanding about this problem in Nilgiri. Yeah. Thank you, Pradeep. Thanks for this uh, clarification. Thank you. So, shall we take Pradeep, like I think minute? we are exceeding time. People are just sitting yeah. here. So I think we can uh, go we into can the take a few questions. Yes, yes. Uh, if George, if it's okay that we can stop our conversation and move to the next session. Yeah, we can just move on to Q&A session now. And as mm -hmm. Pradit already answered two of Vadirad's questions, so we'll just move on to the third one that he has asked. Uh, so uh, he's saying that uh, he's guessing that the uh, lumps which you're seeing on TARS are hemorrhagic septicemia, possibly picked up from cattle. So he wants to know uh, your comment, Pradit, on and your, uh, of course, no documentation, as you said. So he just wants to know your take on that. So that's what, because you know, I'm not a veterinarian to, you know, just come up with things. But we have got a collaboration with veterinary team. What they suggest is that it could be of that, assist of that uh, particular type of uh, war. One thing, and they have actually collected secondary information for that, and they, uh, you know, it's most probably close to eighty percent, ninety percent. It could be of cyst of that particular one, but otherwise, veterinary team is also you know, they need to confirm it by collecting clinical samples. 
unless otherwise we collect we have uh, clinical samples we cannot say that whether it could be you know it can be it could be or it possibly they don't have any of all these possible options they say that most probably it could be because of that war so and if i mean like this is like three months away from now we'll definitely have what would be the reason because we have secured permissions we are the climatic conditions is all good to go so we will in another week's time we will start our field works in a couple of months we'll at least capture one or two individuals collect clinical samples we'll publish the results immediately also if somebody is interested to getting in touch to know what is happening you can mail me in my mail ID. that's share the yeah take another question now it is from sudeep uh, he wants to know what diseases can threaten isolated populations of tar to a dangerously low number put on more disease no that's what one population has wiped out but there is no proper documentation so that is not there so that actually this can happen vice versa because uh, uh, people taking cattle to graze in the grasslands high altitude grasslands so this it's, a, it's all communicable disease from uh, domestic uh, goats and cattle it can pass to wildlife from wildlife also it can pass to vice versa to uh, domestic cattle also it can happen if something happens from the wild and it can get into domestic all that domestic uh, life will also you know these diseases are contagious and that population can also it can be you know lost to both wildlife and domestic as well so that is what though it is being a minor thing we are trying to see the you know cattle grazing as a small threat for tar conservation if cattle grazing is cattle is being penned in the top of the hill for like months together and cattle grazing so competition for food is there one it's happening and second there is if there are any chances of this communicable disease it can actually get communicated with each other so that would be the answer for this question thank you uh, the next uh, question is from kushal he wishes to know how does the isolated population sustain I don't know whether it is for tar or elephants, but I would like to know about elephants from Navinthan, as due to fragment uh, like habitation habitat fragmentation, a lot of populations are like getting isolated, and that too like corridors, uh, uh, the the many uh, structures coming up in corridors, a lot of population are not moving. So how such populations are sustaining with so much like habitat destruction and all taking place? So what is this? Status of inbreeding, like, is it affecting the population negatively, or like, what is the status right now of elephants? Uh, see, we are not into got into that much clear into like whether there's inbreeding happening in elephants or not. We are not yeah. in that kind of state. When when we say about the population, uh, the habitat connectivity problem, we know like what is the uh, what that area can have a sustainable population of elephants. For example, if you talk about crime too, we say that around 600 to 700 elephants are there in that particular landscape. But do we have enough forest for that particular patches? Do the uh, uh, still the encroaching, still the forest habitat or encroachment is like still happening? So how do we how do we come out of this kind of solution now? Still the permissions are being given up. We know the problems are happening, but still the uh, things are happening. But the animals has its own way of uh, living in that isolated. That's it. But there's no other point. At the end of the day, the animal might come into conflict or the animal might have been chased away from one patch to other patch. For example, it's from in the Coimbatore Valley to uh, uh, from Coimbatore Valley to Madhukar, it's in Madhukar to Jinpalakar, then Palakar to Kerala. The animal might have moving. We doesn't. We have not clearly like uh, there, there is one study like which has happened in Poor that we uh, did recently studied in Poor. Where uh, kind of uh, 40, 60 individuals we call it around 50 to 4 individuals. These individuals have been resident in coffee estates. We thought this individual might move to Nagarone and to Bandipur, but in our case, these individuals are never moved. They have been adapted to live in that particular area. Now it has been seen. When we talk about uh, landscape, we have to talk about the agroforestry also, rather than talking about pure wildlife habitat. How do these animals are being changed? They have, they have modified their self to live in that particular place. They know if they go, they're moving out of this particular area, they are unsafe. They're, they're, they are getting into electrocutions, they're getting into roads, they are being uh, chased away, they are continuously being chased away. So they don't know. 
they can they they are learning themselves to be okay if we move out of this particular surrounding we are unsafe so we have to train ourselves to be in that particular so they have been adapted to that particular area rather than uh, we say like okay this is really something yeah males are been moving because males have the capacity from moving for that one place because a single individual or even if a two to three bulls they try to find out they have it as they have they have the enough power to come out with of certain uh, barriers but females with the young ones and calves they are highly uh, sensitive and they want to stay safety from swans when there is a calf so animals they are trying to uh, they are trained to themselves be in that particular they have been adapted in that particular but this is the example i'm saying about food but i'm talking about central indian landscape in bandargad tiger reserve for 8 years in 2016 there is no elephant has been in, in bandargad i've been working for 8 9 years but, no, but after that now there were 3 to 4 years continuing that there is the elephant movement now these elephants have been adapted to live there. in high tiger area there's got this high tiger density still uh, 32 32 to 40 elephants have been residing in that particular area so they have been adapted to that particular area they might have been highly threatened in in their part or in their previous living areas but there are previous history before 70s and 60s there are elephants in that particular region but now maybe after 30 40 years this elephant might have on their path and coming back so each and every landscape has the unique and the elephants have been adapted to live in that particular they have been adapted as well as a force to live in that particular area so we have a question from dr s vijay mohan his question is does tar yeah. get into conflict with people like elephants yeah if so, if so how, how intense it is comparing to hc so one thing no conflict in general what we perceive is that the loss to the people what we generally perceive is that whatever uh, loss people is facing from i mean from our end. so but in terms of tar no so i would uh, describe conflict as like you know the threat to the tar from the human perspective because this is an ungulate in being and it doesn't actually go and feed because this is purely restricted to open and cliff areas in some places it comes you know as close to you know roads especially in one place in valpare on the way to valpare attakati to that place it comes but from the past historical uh, uh, extinctions what has happened is that right? populations for which is closer to human habitation so people actually because it's a uh, sheep or goat because it looks like goat but genetically it's more similar to sheep it's a sheep so what the people does is it they go and catches the animal they kill it and they eat it because 100 kg and it's natural protein so and you don't have money and in earlier uh, terms no when there is because this is distributed in kerala tamil nadu border so people uh, used to do this marijuana cultivation ganja no this marijuana cultivation in the uh, state boundary areas because in terms of when you're coming for an you know perambulation a raid for uh, this, people actually can move to other state because when you have a state boundary it's easy for them because they don't have jurisdiction to go and catch these poachers in the other area so what from the historical observation we get to see is that this is like six months crop you need to go stay there do this uh, you know properly maintain it six months you get so what they do is they poach or they kill this uh, tar because it's 80 kg 100 kg they try it they bring it down they sell it take the money take the ration and go there and live there. so this is all past observation and many of the areas where we had local extinction is because of conflict in terms that conflict in not sense people have gone and killed the animal and it has been you know uh, eliminated from that particular spot. so in terms of conflicts like elephants when we actually see you know crop damage or house damage or life loss there is nothing happening on human side from nilgirita but what is happening is there are a lot of pressures from the humans to the tar so that conflict is there and you know but now because of wildlife protection act and uh, proper strategic patrollings in place so all these things have gone down to a greater extent maybe like you know 0.5 or 1% of some of these illegal activities may happen at some of the remotest areas or you know some of the highly negligible isolated areas so that is
another question is for Dr. Navin Tan. Yes. As a research student, what are the topics uh, or area that we can study or do the research studies on elephants based on what you shared today? So, um, but uh, Tansu Sangma wants to know that. Thank you, Sanu, for this question. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> before getting into the research topic, first we have to identify which is the landscape that we are going to do it because each and every landscape has unique kind of problems. It's not about the common problem is there, but all the common problems have a unique way of solving. But if you talk about Central Indian landscape, there's a different kind of issue. When we talk about uh, even in South India, when we talk about agroforestry landscape or the uh, natural forest habitat as in Pyramid or Palakkad or those down south, it's a different kind of issues. When we when we when we select into the when we before select into the topics, we have to see what what needs to be done in particular that particular landscape. For example, if you talk about poor Nagarulay and Bandipur kind of area, poor is totally a different landscape compared to Nagarulay Bandipur. We can't have a similar research topic where which covers Mudumalai, Bandipur, and Nagarulay as similar towards core. It's a totally of agroforestry type and which is very small isolated pocket patches. But where you have a continuous forest pattern down south from Brahmagiri, Nagarole, it connects to Bandipur, Mudumale, and Coimbatore Forest Division. So the topic should be selected in such a way where we have to find what is the major problem is happening and how to resolve this kind of problem. So when we when we address those kind of uh, topics, then accordingly that the research topic can be selected rather than having an overall assumption of of enthusiasm rather than doing an enthusiasm kind of study, do a proper ecological needs for that particular landscape. So if these kind of can be identified, the topics can be easily selected. For common thing, when we talk about this region, now the conflict mitigation measures, the corridor connectivity patches, the habitat restoration, weeds, uh, where, where the habitat restoration, the food habits, how do food habits can be improved, when the food habits have been improved, the animals might not come outside. So all these things can be considered and accordingly topics can be selected. So there's another question from Thareer Amal. Uh, he wants to know if there are any behavioral differences between Thar population in these fragmented areas since they are living in climax habitat. And there is a comment from S. Vijay Mohan, Dr. S. Vijay Mohan too. So if you want to take it, you can take it forward. Now, in the... So this was the behavioral differences. Actually, no are living in connected areas also living in climax habitats only. Isolated area also is living in the climax habitat. So behavioral differences will only, what we get to see is that if there are you know, incidences of illegal hunting or killing of animal, that can be easily understood that if we get into this isolated areas, when, when a glimpse of us is, you know, when the tar get to see a clip of any human presence, it immediately run into clipping. Generally, tar is shy, but in isolated areas, if it is behaving like that, then we can get to know that it's because of anthropogenic pressures, not because of you know fragmented habitat. Because tar generally you know, doesn't have any behavioral changes. With uh, in response to you know whether it is going to be you know a greater habitat or a fragment habitat or an isolated. So we don't observe any behavioral changes based on the type of habitat or the availability of the habitat. This behavioral changes can be you know observed if there are some anthropogenic pressures. At the same time, no, this can also be you know. Uh, turned positive in some places where there is minor forest produce collection is happening and they don't harm this uh, individual in any means. When there are minor forest produce collection happening also, you get to, people get to see tar in close vicinities. So that is one positive way of observation that tar is feeling, you know, getting comfortable with human presence. So general uh, behavioral change or observation, what we get to see is based on level of anthropogenic pressures rather than you know whether the habitat is isolated or connected or large or small so that would be make inference of us thank you all right thank you pradeep there is one more question coming from dr uh, vijay mohan from sri lanka so he uh, wants to know from navintan that uh, 
according to report from india it is indicating that the elephant population is on the rise and in sri lanka it is also the same although as davinton has mentioned that elephant population in sri lanka is around 4000 now it could be over 6500 this is happening despite forest clearance in india and sri lanka both forest clearance creates grasslands which is good for elephants isn't it good for elephants so he wants to know your opinion hey thanks for this question yeah population is is being uh, in the in the in the race in sri lanka as well as in india in, in, in india it is still being raised but not that much raised but yeah the uh, the data which have been provided is uh, the old data not the recent data of course the, i'll i'll recorrect my data with the sri lanka with the 6500 if any documents is there it can be much more added point for us to add those points it will be easy for us to recollect us rather than like we want to stand with our data it's like it's always better to recollect that thanks for uh, cl uh, clarifying that now of course what you said is despite of clearing a uh, clearance happening the forest the, the population is being increased and uh, not all the clearance forest is being converted into grassland are these are natural grasslands we have to think that into consideration if we think it's a natural grassland yeah the problem of having this larger grassland for a larger larger sustainable is fine but now the grasslands have been artificially modified uh, where a lot of uh, nat other than natural grasses the artificial grasses like we can say the un unpenetrable grasses which is coming so when this unpenetrable grasses are being more uh, in the particular area or for example weeds are being more uh, pruning and coming in this particular grassland making this grassland will not make much uh, valuable for these uh, this species the animals might use this landscape might, might use this particular patch but we will not have conclusive evidence how far this food habits will change their thing so that we have to uh, have a consideration before we move it but what is happening in the current in certain areas and clearance of these weeds and clearance of these particular patches are really good that what that, that is the step what is our department is doing on the clearance of weeds uh, in the elephant crop population area or even high high zone area like they, we have created into three different zones high population area low, low population area and medium population like the high population area the habitat ma management uh, activities or improving the habitat or restoration of habitat is being uh, having a considerable increase but are we continuing that for a longer period i will say like we we are not continuing for a long period instead of having a, a dvding for uh, twice or three years in a year we are doing only once so that that might take a dig in making these grasslands in, in a better shape rather than we say like we are making a shape but we have to make a better shape to use these uh, rather than for the elephants for a smaller herbivores at least for the smaller herbivores. yeah i hope it might clear you thank you Right, so there is another uh, yeah. comment for you, uh, Namintan. So, yeah, there is another comment for you from Dr. S. Vijay Mohan. If you'd like to, yeah, I was just going uh, the Department of Wildlife Conservation estimate of around six thousand elephants in twenty twenty one. Yeah, I, I'll I'll take this. I'll I'll recollect this data from my slides. Yeah, thanks for that, Vijay uh, Mohan. Uh, Thank you. All right, so these were all the questions for us like today, and. Uh, yeah, thank you both of you for giving us such good knowledge about tar and elephants. And uh, it was a really, really wonderful and insightful session. I guess we all learned so much from your discussions and your uh, talks both. And now I'd like you uh, to say like that, uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for thanks to all the participants for staying so long, even though we, we are past our usual time. So thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, so we for now, like, us. Yep. Thank, you. thank you for inviting us and uh, giving us time for sharing your views and experience and also gain experience from others and sharing these details. Yeah, it's really a wonderful day and it's an easy day for United States and we'll remember this for the next year. But uh, on this particular day, we also given a kind of uh, had a discussion with so many people who love this species and have like conservation uh, behind their mind and going around with all of our, we have other works and then we have stepped in to listen to certain things. And thanks for all the people who are listening for this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us.